Hello everyone and welcome to this new edition of Euro Question, the bi-mostly webinar by the Jacques Delors Institute. Today I have the pleasure to welcome Eulalia Rubio, senior researcher at the Jacques Delors Institute. In November 2022, the European Commission has frozen EU grants to Budapest following numerous irregularity in Hungary use of the EU fund. Similarly, the Polish government has undermined the independence of the judiciary since becoming to power in 2020. 15 and has trying to backtrack on such a measure since the beginning of 2023 in the hope of releasing funds from the European Recovery Plan. Where do we stand today on this access to the EU fund by Hungary and Poland? What amount of the fund are currently suspended, cohesion or recovery plan? By what mechanism or horizontal conditional conditionality linked to the respect of the fun fundamental rights that apply on cohesion fund? conditionality and the rule of law and condition of access to the recovery, recovery and reason, resilient facility. And on what condition that are imposed by the European Commission on, by, on each country to lift these suspensions. Before handing the floor to a speaker, I would like to remind you that the Q&A tools is available at the bottom of the screen. Eulalia, you have the floor. Thank you, Lara. Yes, indeed, these Euro questions, we had this idea of doing it because we realized that there were a lot of confusions between which different mechanisms are at play today, spending or blocking the access to EU funds to mainly to Hungary and partially to, to Poland. And the idea is to put a bit of clarity to this. Um, and, and I will try to do this in the, in the, in the, in the following uh, minutes. Uh, the first thing to take into account is that there are three different mechanisms actually at play which can be used by the union to suspend or even to reduce the amount of EU funds uh, to one member state in case of infringement of a certain rule of law uh, principles. I will put the slide here uh, so that you can you can see it. Doesn't work, <laughs> sorry. Yeah, okay, so here you have the three mechanisms. The first one is this new mechanism that has been created in, uh, it, it has entered into force in 2021, that is the rule of law conditionality mechanism. And basically it is a mechanism that allows uh, the union, the council more precisely, upon proposal of the commission, to, uh, to suspend or to cut EU funds to a member state in case of infringement of a rule of law principle, if this infringement has a negative consequence for the EU budget. Not all types of uh, you know, breaches of rule of law principles can be uh, a ground to activate this mechanism. The activation, the triggering is, su is subjected to specific conditions, but basically the, the overall uh, objective is this, to, to have something that the council can activate and the type of measures that the council can apply are very varied. I mean, uh, it's up to the commission to propose to the council different types of measures. And in case uh, this mechanism is triggered and the commission, the council adopts the mechanism, then uh, the member state that is affected can always try to negotiate or it negotiates with the council a list of remedial measures. So if the EU funds are suspended, then they can uh, negotiate with the member state which type of remedial measures this member state can put into place to lift the suspension. That's the, the first mechanism. It has only been applied once uh, to Hungary, very recently, uh, and it can be used to suspend all type of funding. That's also very important to take into account. It's not only EU cohesion funds, it's not only recovery and resilience funds, it's any type of EU funds. The second mechanism, which is not really a mechanism to suspend EU fund, but it has more or less in practice term, in practical terms, the same uh, effect, is the recovery and resilience facility. The recovery and resilience facility is a new instrument that was created in this uh, after the COVID crisis uh, as part of this package of wide ranging measures that were put into place to react to the crisis, and it is a is an instrument that serves to finance. Uh, national recovery and resilience plans. Um, all member states have access to these uh, RF funds and to have access, they have had to, uh, to prepare and to submit to the council these RRF plans, national recovery and Resi resilience plans. Uh, these plans have been assessed by the commission and then approved by the council. The particularity of these plans is that they, um, they have to be aligned to EU priorities in general. So there is a strong focus on, for instance, twin transition no, to help member states to adapt to this digital and climate transition. But they also, each member state 
has uh, to use these plans to partially or totally uh, address the country-specific recommendations they have received in the context of the European semester. And another particularity of these plans that also makes them different from the typical EU funds is that each plan has to have not only investments, but also reforms. So member states have to commit to adapt and implement certain reforms in these plans. So what has happened with these plans is that those member states that receive recommendations related with rule of law to put into place things to to guarantee the respect to rule of law in their countries, they, in the negotiation of these plans with the Commission, they have been obliged to introduce reforms in their plans uh, to, to put into place reforms on rule of law aspects, typically justice reforms, for instance. And um, once these plans have been adopted, the way to disburse the money of these plans is that there are different payments. Uh, there is a calendar of payments that is negotiated between each member state and the Commission, and each payment is conditioned to the attainment of specific objectives related with the, with the implementation of these investments and these reforms. So for each payment, there are a, a list of milestones that member states have to fulfill to receive this funding. And the third mechanism is less known, but also very important and quite powerful, and is this uh, so-called horizontal enabling condition on the EU Charter of Fundamental Rights. Uh, this only applies to EU cohesion funds and also partly to migration funds uh, that are managed at the national level. And it consists in two, I mean, the, 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 the first idea to take into account is that there are some general conditions that are uh, apply uh, or imposed to the use of EU cohesion funds. And the Commission, the commission checks uh, the fulfillment of these conditions at the very beginning when, when, when the member states uh, uh, adopt or present the programming, the, the programs, uh, the, the, the partnership agreements that, that we call, and you know they plan the use of these EU funds. And one of these conditions is compliance with the EU Charter of Fundamental Rights. This is a charter that uh, sets out uh, the most basic rights and freedoms citizens in the EU enjoy, like you know very basic rights, like the right of uh, physical integrity or right to a fair trial, but also the typical one or very important one is the right, the right not to be discriminated on the grounds of race or gender or, or religion or whatever. And member states, what we people have to take into account is that this charter actually is not binding to member states in all the activities, but is binding to member states when they apply EU law and also when they plan and execute EU funds. And therefore, uh, through this horizontal enabling condition, the Commission makes sure that member states comply with this charter in the planification of execution of EU funds. Now, how these three uh, mechanisms have been applied to Hungary or to Poland, let's see this. In the case of Hungary, actually, Hungary, I mean, we have the three mechanisms at play, actually. The Commission has uh, more or less uh, strategically and somehow use the three mechanisms in different ways to suspend EU funds uh, on Hungary on the grounds that uh, there were breaches to the rule of law principles. The first one is the rule of law conditionality, conditionality mechanism. As I have said, is the only country to which this new mechanism has been applied. Uh, Hungary has now uh, roughly six billions of EU cohesion funds that is more or less 20% of the EU cohesion funds for the new programming period suspended on the grounds of this rule of law conditionality mechanism. And the grounds to suspend these funds have been mainly related to two issues, uh, the weakness of the public procurement system in Hungary and the problems of general weakness also in the fight against corruption and fraud. Um, therefore, uh, in consequence, uh, when this suspension has been adopted, which was in December 2022, at the same time, the Council also negotiated with Hungary a list of remedial measures, up to 17 remedial measures, that Hungary is supposed to put into place to lift this suspension. So there is a calendar of uh, these remedial measures that is mostly to take, uh, this calendar mostly covers 2022, 2023, but arrives up to 2026 with very specific measures that Hungary has to put into place to have this suspension lift. The second mechanism by which uh, the union has suspend or has you know, prevent Hungary access to your funds is 
the Recovery and Resilience Plan. Hungary was the last country to have the Recovery and Resilience Plan approved. It was approved at the same time that the Council uh, agreed to the suspension of the, of the funds under the rule of law conditionality mechanism. And the Hungarian plan, um, not surprisingly, has some measures related with rule of law. Uh, basically, the measures included in the Hungarian plan are the measures that were agreed as remedial measures to lift the suspension under rule of law conditionality mechanism, but there are also additional measures that are related with the judicial independence, which, to clarify, it, are not measures that are are necessary to lift the suspension under rule of law conditionality mechanism. So it's a bit more than the remedial measures asked to Hungary to lift the, the 6 billion suspension under the rule of law conditionality mechanism. And last but not least, what we have seen also is the application of the horizontal enabling condition for Hungary. And that's quite important because actually uh, one thing that is, uh, it, it was also, I mean, Hungarian government or the commission adopted the partnership agreement uh, setting, you know, planifying how, how Hungary will use this, all the, all the funds on, uh, on EU cohesion funds. And at the moment that was also done at the end of the last year, and um, at the moment of adopting this strategic partnership agreement, uh, the commission explicitly said uh, that they consider that uh, uh, to, uh, to apply this horizontal enabling condition, so they consider that for to say that Hungary complies with the EU Charter of Fundamental Rights in the application of EU cohesion funds, Hungary has to adopt the RRF measures related with judicial independence. And that's important because it's uh, it, 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 it's the first time that the Commission takes a very this such a very extensive interpretation of this conditionality, actually. Until now, the conditionality on compliance with the EU Charter of Fundamental Rights was interpreted in a more restrictive way. It was what basically what the commission did was to check whether the actions, the specific actions put into place by public authorities in planning and executing EU funds were in compliance with the charter, meaning that for instance, in the design of the tenders and the execution of the distribution of funding, there was that was respectful with the principle of non-discrimination. That, that was basically the thing that was done. Now uh, with the Hungarian case, we see that the commission is is, is, is easier to use it in a more you know, extensive way and, and converting this uh, enabling condition in a very powerful instrument actually to block funds. And powerful because as you can see in the slide, I mean, it, we are talking about 20, 22 billions, which is much more than the funds that are suspended under rule of law conditionality mechanism or funds that are under the national recovery plan. And then there are some minor amounts of your funds also that are uh, threatened to be suspended under this enabling condition for other reasons. Basically, the question of this LGTBI law, uh, my, if, if the Hungarian government does not reform this LGTBI law, uh, that can serve as grounds for the Commission to suspend the EU cohesion funds related with education, for instance, these kind of things. Now, for, for Poland, the situation is much, uh, much better, let's say, because actually what we have in Poland, uh, first, uh, Poland, uh, we haven't seen the rule of law conditionality mechanism ad, ap applied to Poland, even, even if some people think that can be uh, a possibility in the future, for the moment, it is not the case. And uh, as regard, regards the horizontal enabling condition, uh, the same, I mean, the commission has not explicitly said that it condition the access to equation funds to put into place reforms uh, to guarantee the judiciary, the judicial independence, as in the case on, of Hungary. That does not mean that it will happen, but for the moment, what as much as we know is that the commission has not made this explicit uh, that they will they will condition the disbursement of EU cohesion funds to these reforms. So for, for the moment, what happens with Hungary is that they, they have to adopt these uh, major reforms on uh, judiciary independence, basically uh, to change uh, a comprehensive reform on the, on the disciplinary regime uh, applied to Polish judges, to have access to the error funds, uh, which are 24 billion. That, that's the situation for Poland. So for the moment, it's just this. It is, there is this need to pass these uh, important reforms uh, on the justice system to have access to ARF funds. For the rest, so far, uh, Poland has access to the rest of the funds. So I stop here and, um, and uh, we'll see if there are questions.
Well, thank you, Eulalia. So as you just mentioned, the respect of rule of law is a key to understand the complexity of the EU fund uh, mechanism. Uh, so we received a few questions. Maybe a first um, question that we can ask, uh, how do we stand on the recovery plan now for Hungary and Poland? Yeah, what we know is that uh, in the case of Poland, uh, there is a draft uh, law uh, to reform the system of disciplinary, uh, the disciplinary regime uh, applied to Polish Jewish. But this law, uh, the president of Poland has decided to, to send it to the constitutional court, and we are waiting for the ruling of the constitutional court to then be adopted by the, by the national parliament. Uh, so we don't know what will, I mean, that, that has to arrive in the coming weeks, but it's also important to clarify that that's only on the national side. So once this law will be adopted, then it will be up to the commission to assess this law. And it is the commission that has to tell us whether they consider that this law fulfills all the requisites asked in the national recovery plan, because one thing is that the the, the government say we adopt this law and the other thing is that the content of the law has to be in accordance with the requisites. And in the case of Hungary, it's more or less the same. Uh, we are in, more or less in the same situation. There is a there is a law that uh, that that has been uh, that is going to be adopted soon. Also, there is a, a proposal by the Hungarian government. But again, I mean, we we have to wait until the Commission to assess whether this law uh, fulfills the requisites. And we have, I mean, we have. The, the opinion on uh, on this proposal, the Hungarian uh, law proposed by the government, from some independent experts saying that uh, indeed it does not fulfill all the conditions asked by the Commission. So let's 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 see what happens uh, later on. And yes, I'm sure you will follow that uh, very closely. Uh, maybe a second question. Um, so are these mechanisms uh, on the new conditionality um, of law the answer to the political blockage of the Article Seven? Not really. I mean, uh, as I said, these are all mechanisms that link uh, the respect of rule of law principles to the use of EU funds. So you cannot, for instance, from the very beginning, the first thing is that you cannot use this mechanism uh, to react to certain breaches of rule of law principles that have nothing to do with EU funds. I'm thinking, for instance, all the problems with the freedom of speech or, you know, media pluralism, these kind of things. This does not have a direct effect on the use of your funds, and therefore you cannot use this mechanism. Um, and then, of course, I mean, uh, when we are talking about uh, countries in which there are systemic uh, problems of rule of law, I mean, the more instruments we have at EU level to, to, to try to react to this, the better. So one thing is not substitute to the other, it's all complementary. And all is needed to, you know, to try to to, I mean, to induce uh, changes at the national level. Thank you. Maybe a question on the Swedish presidency, uh, their position of the use of the conditionality mechanism, they used to be very demanding on the issue of the rule of law. Um, are, are they looking for a compromise with uh, Varso or Budapest? A compromise of the Swedish presidency? Well, I don't I don't understand very well the, con I mean, the, the question actually, because uh, Compromise on what? On which instrument, actually? Which well, they, mechanism? They, they used to be very demanding on the rule of law with, for example, the Netherlands. So do you think that they will be more keen to, to be open to uh, Poland and Hungary new position and offer? Yeah, the thing is that uh, if we talk about these three mechanisms, uh, the floor is on, uh, I mean, the, the ball is on the is on the commission's floor now, not on the council's floor. So the Swedish presidency is the presidency of the commission, the council, sorry. And uh, if we think about, you know, the enabling condition for cohesion funds, that's totally at the hands of the commission. It's the commission alone that decides. If we think about the RF, the first step is for the commission to assess whether or not the milestones are fulfilled. Uh, and on the rule of law conditionality, even in this case, even if it's the council that adopts, is the commission who decides to trigger or not the mechanism. So the commission plays a very important role. And uh, I would say even at least in the first steps, even more than the council, actually. Thank you. Uh, could you comment on the Bulgaria's uh, recovery plan? On the Bulgaria recovery plan, well, the recovery plan in Bulgaria uh, has also some rule of law uh, mechanisms. Uh, sorry, rule of law reforms, particularly in the judiciary system and in the and, uh, and some measures to to reinforce the fight uh, uh, against corruption and fraud. Um, for the moment, they are also in delay. 
with the fulfillment of these of these milestones, but we know that the political situation in Bulgaria is complex now. I mean, uh, they are uh, they are in the middle of you know going to uh, the next elections, uh, and they have had many elections in the last years. So I suppose it's difficult. I don't know the intricacies of you know the domestic blockages or obstacles to adopt this law, but I can imagine that it's difficult to pass these important laws when you have you know such a level of political instability in a country. Yeah, maybe the arrival of Maria Gabriel will help. Yeah, uh, right. Wait and see. Uh, another question on the going process to check if improvements are obtained or is just member state that gives their achievement? Sorry, repeat the question. Um, on the ongoing process to yeah. check uh, if there is any improvement. Um, is there just a member state that give their achievement? And is the, they no, are it's the commission that the has commission. to check. That's, what, uh, that's okay. what I was saying. One thing is what happens at the domestic level. So they... They, of course, they have to adopt the laws, but then these laws, the content of these laws has to be assessed by the commission. And it is the commission that decides on the basis of very precise uh, elements and requisites that have been pre-agreed uh, pre with, with the member state. Is the commission that has to check whether this law uh, fulfills all the specific requirements asked uh, to, to approve the payment later on. So it's not the country itself that says this is done and this is fulfilled, it's the commission, uh, the, the very last saying this is fulfilled, actually. And in regress at what is now suspended for Hungary and the reason of the commission, are there the same ground used for diverse regime of conditionality? How to interpret this considering the principle of non bias in item? Sorry. If you're good in no, Latin, no, no. <laughs> the question is here. Uh, so, in, so what? It's not super, uh, no, no, what are the same grounds used? To... Um, I'm guessing is there is a different level um, on the conditionality. I really don't understand. I mean, I don't understand the. I don't know this principle. I suppose that what uh, what you mean? What are the same grounds used for? I mean. If I have inter if I interpret well the question, what is interesting in the case of Hungary is that we have three different mechanisms, as I said, but actually the Commission has has used them in a very complementary way, if you if you see, because as you have seen, the remedial measures that were uh, agreed in the context of the rule of law conditionality have been, I mean, a way of reinforcing, you know, the the, the enforcement of these remedial measures have been using them or in integrating them as milestones in the recovery and resilience plan. And at the same time, the milestones that have included in the recovery and resilience plan uh, as regards judicial independence, which were not in the rule of law conditionality mechanism part, have been put as conditions to uh, have access to the EU cohesion fund. So it's very interesting to see that how, I mean, all has been covered uh, somehow, I mean, through different mechanisms that are ultimately at the hands of the commission and partly also at the hands of the council. Uh, so the same, the same type of measures uh, are partly ob overlapping. Uh, I mean, different, different mechanisms are overlapping each other because uh, they, they use uh, the, same, the same measures are monitored and are used as conditions to lift suspensions in different mechanisms. That's interesting to see this. Thank you. And maybe a question on the potential enlargement to countries. Do you agree that the potential enlargement to country with a no rule of law tradition, let's say, may eat up the internal discussion on this subject? Well, yeah, I mean, that, that, that poses a different challenge, actually. And it's true that, uh, for instance, the rule of law conditionality mechanism, as it is today, it's only applied to member states. So we cannot use it for EU funds used for third countries. I'm thinking on Hungary or another, on Hungary, sorry, on, on Ukraine or other, other countries that are candidates uh, to accession. Uh, there are mechanisms for that. That's not the. It doesn't mean that we don't have anything. But the, the challenges posed are also very, very big. So, so it's true that what we have seen so far, for instance, with uh, with Ukraine, is that in the loans given to Ukraine, guaranteed by the EU budget, there has been an emphasis on putting a lot of specific conditions on fight against corruption, fight against grow, fraud, etc. Much more than in previous loans that we gave to Hung to Ukraine, for instance, because we know that uh, you know we are going, we, we have to go towards you know adapting these member states to the rule of law. Um, requisites we have inside the EU. So of course, that will be an important part of all the funding that we will use 
to help these these countries to 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 harmonize the EU legislative framework and also to harmonize the the governance in general to be aligned to the standards of rural law we have at the at the union. And to follow up follow up on that, uh, apart from Poland and Hungary, are, are there any other member states that are currently or potentially affected by the mechanism? Uh, there are other member states that have received rule of law or have included rule of law reform in the in their plans. I, I mentioned Bulgaria. There is also Romania, for instance, and others. But uh, the other two mechanisms have not been used to any of them. And maybe one particularity, uh, particularity uh, that, that makes Poland and Hungary cases different also as regard the RRF is that for both cases, uh, the Commission has has uh, leveled some of these measures that are required to, to have access to the, to the RRF funds as super milestones, meaning that uh, a list of these reforms uh, have been imposed as preconditions to the first payment. And that's something that has only happened to Bulgaria, to Poland and to, up, up, I mean, in this dimension has only happened to Hungary and to Poland. For instance, some milestones related to justice reforms have been uh, defined as super milestones for these two countries and not to other, for other countries, which have also, uh, like Bulgaria has also some reforms on uh, justice to, to put into place within the RRF uh, system, but they are not super milestones reforms. Uh, another question for blocking funds under the horizontal enabling condition within the CPR, mm -hmm. country have not to comply with the Charter of Fundamental Rights. Do you analyze the scope of this condition, could corruption as breach of the rule of law be a reason to block funds under this enabling condition? Well, it's not that I analyze. I mean, the, the question is that right now there is a big question mark how to interpret this, this conditionality. Because as I said, uh, up to now, uh, the interpretation, the general interpretation by the commission was quite restrictive. And it was just interpreted as a condition that had to be checked uh, on the actions put into place by public authorities managing funds. like. I, as, as I was saying, just looking at you know the tenders, how were organized, and how were implemented, whether they they respect these basic uh, basic uh, rights of non-discrimination, etc. Now, with the Hungarian case, it's the first time that we see the Commission applying this in a much more extensive way, and that opens the you know the possibility up to a point that I am not able to say. I mean, how the Commission will apply this in the future? What I can say is that the application the Commission has explicitly say they will do of this enabling condition for Hungary. It creates a precedent and it's the first time that they do this to apply this enabling condition in such an extensive way. Uh, so, and that's why this is also a question mark for, for Poland, which has also problems of judiciary independence. Thank you. And maybe a last question. Is there a risk that the issue of the conditionality of European funds to the rule of law could be instrumentalized ahead of the European election next year? Well, it is already instrumentalized, I would say. I mean, it's uh, everyday EU politics today to have Hungary and Poland blocking different uh, sectoral uh, legislations to try to, you know, have more uh, influence on this topic of rule of law. So, of course, it will be at the center of the European elections, uh, I mean, it makes no doubt for me that it will be one of the issues uh, for and against. I mean, for the countries that or the parties that want to fight against rural breaches and uh, also the the countries or the parties that have uh, an issue on that. Well, thank you, Eulalia, and thank you to you for following today's webinar. I just wanted to point out your recent publication as uh, requested by the European Parliament that are available on our website. Uh, we will send it a link to you as well as the reply of this request um, soon after the end. Um, so the next session will be held on Wednesday, 7 of June. We will have the pleasure to welcome Christine Verger, the Vice President of the Jacques Delors Institute. She will come back to us ahead of... Um, one year of the European election, she analyzed the importance of the European political parties. I thank you for being with us today and thank you again, Eulalia. Thank you, Lara.